Hi, hello, and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and pipeliner CRM, joining you as usual from sunny San Diego. And today I'm joined from the other side of the country in Annapolis, Maryland, by John Crowder. How are you doing, John? I'm great, John. How are you doing today? Yeah, fantastic. And you've got that wonderful Naval Academy there. That's right. That's what brought me to Annapolis uh, some 30 odd years ago, an opportunity to work there as a varsity football coach. And uh, after that uh, career path had kind of run its course, I decided to stay right here in beautiful Annapolis. Excellent. And uh, John is the uh, VP of Healthcare with uh, Integrity Solutions after 25, uh, following 25 year career in the medical industry. And what we're going to talk about today is, well, we're going to talk about emotions and sales, but we're also going to touch on sales leadership, because I think the two things are connected, to be perfectly honest, because let's face it, John, I mean, people sales people take their cues from sales managers and and sales leaders in in how to operate and and what's important and you know how to um so it is very important that this is that it's set from the top but talk to me a little bit about um just sales leadership in general because it is still an issue a real issue as you know the stats are like people last 16 months or something in their in the sales leader in their first sales leadership job um so give me your thoughts on just sales leadership in general because i think it's a, it's an area that still needs um a lot of help john i couldn't agree more you know and, and you mentioned it they are interrelated and emotion comes uh into this we're emotional beings and uh, sometimes when we don't know how to coach well and we don't know how to sell well and we don't know how to connect with people on a human level, we're seen as being tone deaf, tone mm -hmm. deaf to our customers needs. And if you're the leader, that customer needs are the people that report to you. Uh, you know, there are very interesting statistics that have come out about leadership. We know that this has been true for over 25 years and it was just validated recently in additional studies the number one reason people leave an organization is because of their boss. Mm -hmm. right? We know that we know that employee engagement in the United States, according to Gallup, is approximately 30 percent. And the number one factor that impacts employee engagement at about 70 percent is the boss. Mm -hmm. so, so we know that they play a critical, critical role, uh, not only in productivity and retention and hiring, uh, but in, in just keeping people engaged in what they do on a daily basis. Yeah. And let's face it. I mean, it's, it's a very hard job. And as we know, a lot of people are promoted uh, into a sales leadership position because they were a top salesperson, um, but they're never given any leadership training. They're certainly never given any coaching training. And I'm glad you mentioned that coaching element, because I think that's one of the most critical ones, because most people you were, a, you were, a, as you said, Demi, you were a, a football coach, right? Um, a lot of people, that was their last experience of coaching in their mind was high school or something, whether they're on volleyball team or whatever, and somebody's screaming at them from the sideline, telling them what to do. And then they tend to carry that and think, okay, the best thing I can do if I was a top performer is just tell you to copy what I did. Yeah, absolutely. And that's the skill set that they're given. That's what they know best. And that's what they want to execute. This is what I did to be successful. And I'm going to tell you what you need to do to be successful. Mm -hmm. So a couple of things happen there. Uh, one is, is that eventually, uh, particularly if you're dealing with experienced people, after I've told you five or six times what to do to be successful, my value proposition for you has run its course. Yeah. Right. And so telling people what to do is what we call managing them. Everybody still you still as a leader need to have management skills, telling people what to do, how to be compliant, how to meet expectations, uh, how to manage to a clear uh, vision. That's all a part of leadership. Uh, when we transition to coaching and leader leadership itself, those are different skills. And so mm -hmm. coaching, in, in, in my mind, is how do we improve performance? Yep. Managing is telling people what to do. Coaching is how do we improve performance? Now, here's the thing. If I tell you as the leader how to improve performance, if it's coming one way, yeah. then I'm managing you. I'm not leading you, right? I'm managing you when I tell you how to improve, improve performance. Mm -hmm. So what I want to do as a coach when I'm coaching people is how do you think you can get better? Yeah. What do you need to do to improve performance? When mm -hmm. you're telling me as your boss 
what you need to do, the accountability shifts from me to you. Mm -hmm. The ownership shifts, the ownership, excuse me, shifts from me to you. Now, you may or may not have a clear vision of what you need to do to get better. And that's where I really bring value to the equation mm -hmm. because I can then say, I'm not going to tell you what else you need to do. I'm going to ask you questions. Mm -hmm. What if you did this? How would this help? If we did this, how might that change the equation? How would we execute at this level? Because again, I want to tee that up for you to be able to verbalize to me and give you the ownership on what you need to do to improve. And I think the third piece, I'll just add this real quickly is why is that important? Right. Right. That's where the leadership comes in. Mm -hmm. When when you're able to coach to the why, right? When, when, when you're able to say, why is this important to your clients? Why is this important to the organization? Mm -hmm. Why is this important to uh, your colleagues? And probably most important, why is this important to you? Exactly. And, and your road to success. So so leading is is more than just telling people what to do from a management perspective. No, absolutely. And there's a um, I mean, in years ago, like I ran the organization Hathaway, which is spin selling and Neil Rackham's um, research. So research, research based. And one of the things that they discovered during the research is that a lot of top performing salespeople are what you would call unconsciously competent. They don't actually know what may, and when you sit them down and try to ask them like, what makes you good? Yeah, they'll, they'll give you something but they don't really know they just do it so therefore if you if you go into a leadership position and you just say do what i do and i don't even know what i really do i mean it's a it's not a great recipe <laughs> you're, you're right you know and, and it's it's interesting so that a lot of times and something that we've seen is is that we take away that unconsciously competent skill set mm -hmm. and so what do i mean by that uh, let's say that somebody has great interpersonal communication skills. They're able to connect with others on the human level. They, they seek to understand. They have genuine curiosity. And then particularly in healthcare, we bring them in and, and we have to start out with a foundational concept. And I think the foundational concept is this, is that most people, when I say most, all people, when they come into their first sales role, believe that selling is talking about their product. Mm -hmm. That's my that's my belief system, right? That, that that's that's what I have in my brain. And then, particularly in the healthcare industry, we give you a tremendous amount of information, technical information, clinical information. It only strengthens my belief system that talking about my product is selling. That's mm -hmm. how I bring value to my customers through information. Well, what we've done is we've stripped away their ability where we've covered up their ability to connect with people on a human level yeah, yeah. because in their mind, their belief system is I'm going to bring value to you by what I tell you and by the service I provide you, not by being a problem solver, not by understanding where you want to take your practice, not by offering you solutions, but by giving you information. Mm -hmm. and, and by the way, what you outlined there uh, about the coaching model just a few moments ago, everything you outlined about the coaching is good selling. If it's it's asking questions, it's trying to uncover, it's trying to help the other person actually uncover and discover themselves. So it's it's when you're coaching properly, you're also teaching somebody how to sell properly. You know what? I I, I don't know how many people are going to be watching my facial mm -hmm. expression on that one. A big smile on my face. I couldn't agree more, right? And it it's the foundation of what we teach, right? And how do you connect with other people? And it really starts with what's your belief system around what is selling. Mm -hmm. right? is selling is selling giving information or is selling identifying needs offering solutions solving problems right those are two different skill sets right giving information solving problems two mm -hmm. different skill sets two different ways to get there the same thing goes with coaching right it's yeah. the same philosophy what's your view of leadership is it telling people what to do or is it trying to grow and develop people into mm -hmm. new skills encourage them identify where they want to go and support them in those efforts and it all starts with your belief system. No, and a hundred percent. And and part of that too is how do you feel not just about what you do and where you go, but how do you feel about being a salesperson? Because I think that's an incredibly important one. Because if you're not confident and proud in what you're doing, if you're a little bit reticent, you you know buy into the popular you know culture about ooh, salespeople you're going to carry again you're going to transmit that so it is very important also to understand how do i feel about myself my role everything you know 
it's the first thing that we teach at Integrity Selling, right? Is, is mm -hmm. what is your belief? What is your view of selling? What are you trying to accomplish? And if your belief system is, and unfortunately, we have a lot of wonderful, intelligent people that have, have, have great reputations and great honor, and we teach them, we condition them. It's a, it's a type of mental conditioning that your sales process is very product, self, and mm -hmm. company oriented. And that comes through in their interactions with their customers. And you know what happens is that the customer senses that this is about you and not about me. And the rep feels that way. And so what we see over time, and we call this the fatigue curve, message fatigue curve, is that once I've gone out here and I my, my view of selling is it's about me and my product and my organization, and I've given you that message over and over again, over time, I get message fatigue. I don't mm -hmm. want to talk about my product anymore because I can see in your body language and in your interaction, you've heard it enough. And so now what's happened is my interactions have, have, have been, for lack of a better term, dumbed down to report building. They're, yeah. they're, they're not about identifying customer needs and, and, and offering solutions and, and building deeper relationships. It's about the superficial belief that I've given you all the information. And now if you just like me, if you just continue to... Uh, see me every now and then, you'll continue to use my product. And and people are capable of so much more than that, but it starts with their foundational belief, as you said. Yeah. And, and no, and I, I, I agree with you. And I think, I think the, the world we live in today, especially coming out of the pandemic and all of that is the relationship part is, is more important than ever, to be honest, not that it was ever not important, but I mean, I think it's even accentuated now. So um, if you're, if you're not, connecting and if you're not coming across as authentic and as as somebody who's helpful problem solver like you said you're going to get you're going to get moved out pretty quickly because the antennas are up i think even more than ever absolutely and and, and we don't tend to train people on how to mm -hmm. be authentic mm -hmm. uh, all of the steps from being a salesperson to being a consultant are much easier translated absorbed and then executed with your customers when you're genuine, yeah. when you genuinely care. If I have a genuine interest about where your business is and where you want to take it, and I can help you get there, that comes through not only in the questions that I ask, but in the value I offer mm -hmm. you. And, and, and so you know, that shifts the equation and, and your customers see that in you. Yeah, absolutely. And I think the other thing, just coming back to the to the coaching part too, uh, and just a general philosophy is, you know, we're humans, we're very hardwired, you know, uh, if you've been through, as we all have in the past, performance reviews, you know, those awful annual performance reviews, yeah. they come in and say, John, well done, you did this really good last year. Now here's the 52 things that you sucked at and you need to work on right? Because we just always go there. And it's the same in uh, today is that we need to look at people, look at their strengths and say, how can I make the most of those? How can I um, use those strengths and maybe configure the role so that it's it plays to their strengths as opposed to trying to get people to be good at things that they're never, ever going to be good at? Absolutely. And, you know, year end reviews are a pet peeve of mine. And, yeah. you know, I think I think what happens is that most managers have one big mistake that they can commit if they're not aware of this. And that is that is an opportunity to re recruit your best people, mm. re recruit your best people, show them the appreciation, outline it. Right. And then it's OK to have a discussion sure. about about where they can improve and what they need to do next to get a promotion or to to advance their career. That that's all a part of it, but it's also a time to show that appreciation for them. I think quite often that it's missed, unfortunately. And I think the other part of it is there shouldn't be any surprises, right? There shouldn't be gotcha moments in those year-end reviews, nor should there be in in the reviews that you write on a weekly or monthly basis for your people. It should be something that you show managerial courage about. And, and you have those discussions. And, and can I just say this? Um, one of the things that we teach is that if you want your sales team to be consultative sellers, you have to be a consultative leader. Mm -hmm. And part of that process is this. And, and I ask this question when we teach leadership classes and sales classes. How do you hold an adult accountable? 
So the, the, the conversation quite often goes like this. Mm -hmm. We ask them first, how do you hold a teenager accountable? And you get all kinds of answers. You know, you take away their, their, their cell phone and you take away their, their uh, Wi-Fi and their car and their allowance and all these. Different. So everybody knows how to hold a teenager accountable. But how do you hold an adult accountable, particularly somebody that's not even a peer, that maybe it's at an elevated status? Let's say mm -hmm. it's a lay person selling to the chief of cardiology. And so one of the key concepts is, is how do we hold them accountable? It's through their words through understanding where they want to go, through understanding what the next step is for them, from understanding what their needs are. Now, all of a sudden, right, it's easier for me to say, well, Dr. Smith, you said you wanted to do this moving forward. This is what I would suggest that we do to accomplish that goal. Are we in agreement? And if mm -hmm. they say yes, now all of a sudden, we've got natural ability or accountability built between adults to move important initiatives forward. Yeah. And I mean, and that's such a different, that's a different approach, but, but that, that approach comes from a place of confidence of of, com of being confident in yourself being confident in your product being confident in in your ability to uncover problems and being confident saying like i've helped other people i can help you too but that that comes from confidence and too often we see people kind of reticent and it comes across that reticence i want to deal with somebody who's confident yeah absolutely and and you know as it as it comes to leadership right um how, how do leaders influence that that confidence level? How do, how do we how do we keep people to step outside of their comfort zone? And, and one of the fundamentals of that, and I don't, I don't know, John, if this is uh, uh, addressing what you were saying there, but but we can't create an environment where people are afraid to make mistakes, and and, and, and quite frankly, to you know have learning opportunities, right? And then how we coach to that is vital. Yeah. When people make mistakes, if we hammer them, guess what they're going to do? They're going to go right back to their comfort zone. Yep. They're already nervous. We need to set that vision for them, help them get there, and then ask them questions. What went well? Right. And then not what did you do wrong? Right. Mm -hmm. that, that creates a defensive mechanism. When you ask people, what did you do wrong or where did you fail? They're immediately going to put their hands up. Go, hang on a second. Right. Now, when we ask them, what would you do different next time? Yeah. What could you do better? Just tweaking the tone of that creates an environment where people feel more comfortable coming outside of their comfort zone. Yeah, no, I mean, I think that that's ab absolutely 100%. And I think that's why um, the other part of coaching is, especially from a sales leader point of view, is to make it routine, right? So it's something that you do that's expected. Because one of the, one of the traps that sometimes... Uh, you know, sales leaders will fall into is that they'll say, oh, "Okay, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm going to, uh, I'm gonna do some coaching sessions. We're not gonna talk about pipeline and all that. We're gonna talk about, we're gonna work on you, and I'm gonna give you my time. I put it on your calendar, but four times out of five, I cancel it because something else comes up or I move it. And now you're communicating to me. Not that stuff doesn't come up, and of course it does, but you're you're now sort of communicating to me. It's not that important, and I'm not that important." John, you're so right. And, you know, it, it's it's interesting. Um, um, leadership development is sorely lacking throughout our throughout our country and, and probably throughout the world. And oh, so yeah. we, we did a research study and we found that over 60 percent of leaders are left to define coaching themselves. Yeah. Now, now imagine that. So so I want, you know, the way I grew up, right, is that your number one job is to hire great people and your number two job is to develop those people. That's mm -hmm. the fun, fundamental foundation of coaching, right? But now all of a sudden, if I don't have that as my mission as a leader, right, then other things get in the way. And, and I tend to let other things take over what should be my primary responsibility, which is hiring great people and developing them to their highest level. Uh, it, a lot of it has to do with, um, again, that lack of ability to coach. And I'll, I'll tell you this, something that's interesting. When we, we interview people, uh, in, particularly in the, in the medical sales arena, mm -hmm. what we hear from the frontline leaders, uh, and now imagine how, how, how this is interconnected, right? The frontline leaders say, um, I don't have time to coach. And mm -hmm. the senior leaders say they're frustrated because my sales leaders are trying to lead their teams from behind a desk. Yeah, I would say that the cause of that is the same. It's a lack of a shared mission. It's lack of a shared definition. People don't have the skills on how to coach and develop individuals. So after they've told them how to do their job, 
the best thing I can do is be an administrator. They actually end up becoming the administrative assistant to the sales reps. Let me clear. Let me let me let me check your PTO schedule. Let me let me check your expense reports. Let me make sure that I can do all the paperwork so that you can get your contracts and let me do all this stuff because I don't have the skill set skill set, excuse me, to grow and develop you in your role. Yeah, no, and that, that I think that's um, that's a that's a critical point because at that stage, to be honest, rather than having a sales leader, you might as well just have a sales operations yes. person. Um, and uh, and yeah, I mean, there's there, there's so much there's so much in that we're running out of time here, but maybe you'll come back someday and we'll talk all about that that particular part of it because I do think yeah, if, if you're not going to teach people how to coach, if you're not going to show them, you're not going to give them the skill set, then you might as well just have sales operations. That, that, I, I agree. We've got we've got we've got to do a better job training both our salespeople and our leaders to have better relationships, better interactions with their clients. Absolutely. Well, listen, John, this has been great. All of John's information is going to be below this video. But before we go, please do tell a little bit more about you and Integrity Solutions. Well, Integrity Solutions has been around for fifty years. Uh, I will tell you that we're extremely proud of of, of our clientele. Um, I won't be a name dropper here, but I'll give you some categories. The top three medical device companies in the world are our clients. Right. Probably the fifth largest bank in the United States, a major railway, one of the largest chemical companies in the world, um, um, one of the largest hospice organizations. I mean, our, our clientele is really, really impressive. Probably, probably the biggest paint manufacturer. So mm. when you think about you think about Integrity Solutions, uh, it, it's not just medical, it's all over the place. So why do these companies want to partner with us after 50 years with this kind of clientele? And, and it's because we bring the human back to connecting with others. And it helps not only your connection with your clients, it helps the connections within your yeah. own organization and outside of your organization with the people that are in your personal life as well. It's bringing that humanity and that human connection to people, uh, whether you're in sales or leadership that we provide. Yeah, no, I, I, I so agree with you. It's great. Uh, I encourage people to go check it out. We need the human back, especially with all this AI and everything. We need to make sure we keep focused on the human of being the center of all of this. So again, thank you, John. Thank you for watching and listening. See you all again soon. Thank you. Thank you, John. Yeah.